What I'm going to try to do this morning, good morning everybody, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to try to define dignity from a Jewish perspective, and I'll be looking at it from a very traditional or orthodox perspective. So those of my, those of here who are Jewish who may not be orthodox, you may not agree with everything I say, that's okay. I mean, we all have different ways of looking at things, but I'm, a, I'm going to define it from a traditional perspective, and then look at it in the context of end-of-life care, uh, because that's really my area of expertise. So if we look at the first slide, I always like to define things at least loosely. We just heard a lot of definition about dignity, but the Oxford English Dictionary just tells us briefly that dignity is the quality of being worthy, honorable, uh, worthiness, worth, nobleness, excellence, those kinds of things. And in Judaism, the term that's used in, 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 and this really is in the Talmud, which is later Jewish literature, not scriptures itself, is kavod habriot, which translates as honor of the created or create, creations. Because even though it shares those characteristics, kavod means honor, so honor, worthiness, and so forth, the, the main thrust of dignity in Judaism is that it's derived from man's stature both as a creation of God and further as being created in the image of God, which raises man's stature above that of the rest of the animal kingdom, which are also creations of God. But, but the difference here is that man is also created in the image of God, and therefore that gives it that extra status in dignity. Uh, dignity uh, in Judaism looks at not only physical dignity in terms of body cleanliness and so forth, but also non-physical issues, including things like self-respect, societal status, and other things which I don't really have time to delve into in any depth. The next slide will show that the concept really comes from the Babylonian Talmud, the first tractate, tractate Brachot, 19b is the page that it's on. And there's a rabbinical discussion there about a case that while out in public there was a person who realized that he was wearing a garment that contained a mixture of wool and linen. And if you know from scriptures, uh, that's forbidden to wear. It says in, in Leviticus that it's forbidden to wear uh, any cloth that has a mixture of wool and linen. It's called shotnays. And so the ruling in the Talmud first says that the clothing must be removed immediately, even though the individuals will suffer significant embarrassment. And the rabbis bring down from Proverbs to support that, uh, uh, chapter 21, verse 30, there is no wisdom, understanding, or counsel against the Lord. Now, then it goes on to discuss this, argue it, bring other cases that try to refute that. And one of the things that brought, that's brought down is what's called the brysa, which is a rabbinical saying or ruling that didn't make the written, what we call the written oral law, the Mishnah or the Talmud, uh, rather the Mishnah, but is, but is sometimes expressed in the Talmud. And this Baraisa says that human dignity, kavod habriot, is so great that it supersedes a negative commandment of the Torah. So, so you have these almost two conflicting statements appearing within the discussion of the Talmud, and in a couple of slides, you'll see how that all works together. So now the next, I want to show some examples of kavod habriot, or dignity, in Jewish law that, that that are practical, that, that, that show up in scriptures. In, in, in Deuteronomy, Chapter 21, verses 22 to 23, talk about capital punishment in Jewish law. And one of the things that's talked about is after somebody's executed for capital crime, God commands that the body be hanged. However, the rabbi is going to tell you that the body is immediately taken down and buried, since it would violate, in a sense, God's dignity to have his image this man's created in God's image to have the image of God hanging there and becoming deformed and, and, and not appropriate. So it, it, therefore, one is commanded to, even though you hang the body, to immediately take it down and bury the body because of the dignity of the human body having been created in God's image. This is so powerful. This, by, by the way, doesn't apply only to Jews. It applies to non-Jews as well. If you look in the book of Joshua, in chapter 10, it talks about Joshua and, and, and the Israelis the, the, Jew, the children of Israel, the army, defeating five of the Canaanite kings, and Joshua commands that they be hung after they're executed, but then, again, they're taken down and buried before the sun goes down because it's, it's, it's undignified to have those bodies hanging up there for a long period of time. Another way dignity expresses itself in the Bible is in, also in Deuteronomy, in, uh, verses somewhat earlier, uh, 21 uh, verses 1 to 3, which the hook is about what happens when you find a lost object. You're walking in the street, you see a lost object, you must, you're obligated to retrieve it, and there's a whole process by which you're, you have to attempt to restore that to the person who lost it. 
It includes going out and announcing it in public and so forth. The Talmud goes on to tell us that an elderly sage is exempt because it is beneath his dignity to have to go and pick up this object and take it out and, 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 and announce about it. So here's where a status will override, in a sense, the law that one must pick, has the obligation to pick up a lost object and try to restore it. So we go next, uh, we can see that, again, at these two verses that I talked about that were in the Talmud uh, from Proverbs 21.30 and the Sparisa about human dignity are conflicting. How does Jewish law resolve that? Again, without going into all of the machinations, what's interpreted here is that Jewish law will supersede dignity if there's an active transgression of a Torah commandment. In other words, if the only way dignity would be uh, allow, accomplished would be to violate, actively violate a rule or a law, you can't do that. Then the law supersedes dignity. On the other hand, if there's a situation in which the law can be passively unfulfilled, like here the elder who is not, who is not obligated like everybody else is to pick up that object because it's beneath his dignity, he's not doing anything. He's just not doing something then dignity may be used to supersede that under certain circumstances. There are other situations, if, if it's accidental, if it's uh, a law that's not used universally binding, or occasionally relate to financial matters. So there's where dignity may, and I use the word may because not always is it still allowed, but it may supersede uh, on occasion Jewish law. Now one of the interesting things I found as I went through my, my reading on this is that if you look at most Jewish rulings by rabbis, especially as we move uh, into the more modern era, rarely is dignity ever given as a reason why a ruling is made a certain way. And the reason is because dignity, since dignity could in, in, allow somebody to violate a law under certain circumstances, the rabbis were afraid if they started using that too often, it would come where people would start using it for everything. And they were so afraid that it would be abused that they decided they wouldn't use it much. So as I'm going to talk now about some end of life issues, I'm going to tell you right up front, this is my, my own thinking based on what I understand about how dignity operates and what I know about, the, about how Jewish law looks at some of these issues. But I, if you wanted to know where I got the information, there are, nobody's really written about it because the rabbis don't really want to use this to explain what they're doing and why they're making the decisions that they're making. So the first thing I want to look at is something that I think is topical here in California now, which is assisted suicide. And is that really death with dignity? And again, I'm looking at it from a Jewish perspective. And how does Judaism look at what I might, we might think about death with dignity? And I want to start by describing death in the Bible, because I've always found that that's been very helpful to me in terms of my own work and end of life care. Um, and if we look at the way people die in the Bible, we don't see a whole lot. There's very, very little written about it until at the end of the book of Genesis, we see the death of Jacob, which is, encompasses three chapters at the end of the book of Genesis, and it discusses how Joseph goes to him. He gives some of his last wishes to Joseph. He then blesses Joseph's two sons. Then all the sons are called in, and they all stand around his bedside. He blesses his entire family, and then the Bible says he took his legs up into his bed and he died. And if you look at any other death in the Bible, this is not recorded. No, nothing like that is ever recorded. It just says he died and was gathered unto his ancestors, or he, if you go back even earlier, he died, Adam died and begot sons and daughters before he died, and so how old he was. What the, Torah, what the Bible doesn't say, we can find in two places in the Talmud and in what's called the Midrash, which are rabbinical stories and uh, legends that, in a sense, help fill in gaps. And what it says there is, is that before, before Jacob's death, the way people died was they sneezed and their soul left them. In fact, that's probably the origin of why we say God bless you or something else. It comes from a Jewish source called Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer. Jacob went to God and he said, you know, people die suddenly. They don't get sick before they die. Wouldn't it be a good idea if you created illness before death so we have warning and this way we have time to bless our family and take, and, and take care of all of our business and, and tie up our loose ends before we pass away. And God said that would, that's a great idea, you get to be the first one, and that's why Jacob's death is described in the Bible. 
And I use this because I always find this is really what death, to me, that's death with dignity. To, to die like the patriarch Jacob in my bed with, all, in bed with all your children around you, you're able to talk to them, bless them, with, you know, and so forth. That, I would say, we could argue, certainly, you could interpret as being death with dignity. However, if you look at the next slide, in our society, death with dignity has now come, as was mentioned, to really be an, a, a, a sort of used to describe assist, physician-assisted suicide, euthanasia, and those kinds of things. And that's forbidden under Jewish law. And, and, and there's a number of sources that we use to support this. In Deuteronomy, God, God, Moses is talking to the people, and, and he's explaining, God has said, I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. You shall choose life so that you and your offspring will live. And this is really part of the imprimatur that we have to choose. Whenever there's a choice, we always choose to live. As this to the Father says, against your will you were born, against your will you will die. So again, it's not up to us to decide when we die, it's up to God to decide when we die. The death of King Saul, described at the end of the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel and the beginning of the book of 2 Samuel, is also used to illustrate some of this. King Saul was in a battle with the Philistines, the Israelites were losing, we're going to lose the battle, and King Saul didn't want to be captured alive. So he asked his armor bearer to kill him, which the armor bearer refused to do. So King Saul basically fell on his sword and died. Then we go to 2 Samuel, it tells us that an Amalekite came upon King Saul's body, took his head, chopped his head off, figured, gee, I'm going to go to King David. Since they were enemies, he'll reward me and, 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 I'll, and I'll be a real good place. So he takes the head, goes to King David, um, and tells King David not only was Saul dead, but that he, Saul was mortally wounded when he fell on his sword, and, and he asked me to end his life, and I killed him. I ended his life, because he asked me to do that. And David had him taken out and executed for murder. So there are a number of things that come out of this, but one of them is even when the person is mortally wounded, to go and take that person's life is not, is not permitted. That's one of the things we learned from that story. We go to the next slide. This, this is further um, sort of codified, in a sense, by Rabbi Bleich in, in an article that he wrote in 1996, where he explains that Judaism teaches that man has no proprietary interest either in his life or in his body. Man's body and life are not his to give away. The proprietor of all human life is none other than God himself. And there's a, uh, a commentator, Rad Vaz, on, um, on Law and Sanhedrin, uh, uh, 18.6, he phrases it, man's life is not his property, but the property of the Holy One, blessed be he. In other words, this idea is that our bodies don't belong to us. They belong to God, and God decides when we're born, and God decides when we die. Not, we don't get to decide when we die, he does. Next. So, clearly it seems like it's forbidden, but I just wanted to raise this because I think it's really important to think about, could, it, could dignity be invoked in some way to supersede Jewish law. And if you look at the, you know, the current California law, for example, and you look at this, which is modeled after the law in Oregon and Washington, um, where the physicians are required to prescribe medication to the patient, and then the patient is required to ingest the medication him or herself. These are both active things. In other words, the doctor is writing, actively writing the prescription, giving it to the patient, the patient's acquiring and ingesting the medication. And since these both would be, would be violations, because they're both actively done, and you can only invoke Kavod Habriot, dignity, when Jewish law is passively unfulfilled, then this would also, you could not be used to override uh, Jewish law in this circumstance, because everything that's being done here is active. You're doing something active by writing the prescription, by purchasing the medication, and by taking the medication. This is the way I would I reason it. And, uh, and again, I don't think of it as written it in quite this way, but that's the, the way I think it would look. So we go to the next slide. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the ghost states because uh, Dr. Prager is going to give you a whole discussion of it. Basically, it's somebody who's actively dying. And one of the things I want to point out here is that you're not allowed to touch the person, even according to the Talmud, because there's a rabbinical source that describes the ghost like a flickering flame. So if you ever walk by a flickering flame, it goes out immediately, if, if you, just from walking by it. And the same thing could happen here. In, in, in parlance, as, as I say, in hospice, what we call an actively dying person. And the reason I want to bring it up here, a couple of points, is 
Rabbi Moses Feinstein was one of the tw great 20th century rulers in end-of-life care, rabbinical, ruler, rabbinical rulings, says that touching does not refer to basic care needs such as cleansing and providing li liquids to overcome dryness. Routine hospital procedures such as drawing blood or even taking temperature have no place in the final hours of a patient's life. And I wanted to quote this because I think that's an important illustration of where dignity comes in. Again, there's a physical dignity here by keeping the person clean. Now, he never uses the term dignity when he discusses this, but he's still telling us, even though the Talmud says you can't touch the person, certainly you can keep the patient clean. And that's how dignity operates, uh, in part, in, in this setting. Uh, I'm, again, I'm not going to go into these stories. Well, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go to Yudha Hanasi because I know Dr. Prager is going to discuss that. Briefly, Rabbi Hanina ben Tradion story, he uh, was caught by the Romans teaching the Torah in public and was sentenced to be executed at this burnt at the stake, wrapped in the Torah scroll that he was using. They additionally put tufts of wool over his body that were wet to retard the flames and extend his dying, so, so to speak. Um, the guard, first, first the students actually were forced to witness this, uh, ask him to open your mouth, let the flames come in so you'll die more quickly. And he says, I'm not allowed to do that. Which, of course, illustrates the point that one cannot do anything active to, take, to shorten one's life. So then the, the, the guard asked him, what if I took away the tufts of wool? The tufts of wool are only serving to impede the dying. They're serving no useful purpose, but it's an impediment to the flame consuming him. And he says, that you're permitted to do. And he says, well, if I do that, will I be rewarded in the next world? And he says, the rabbi says, yes, you will. And he removes the tufts of wool. The rabbi is consumed by the flame. The guard jumps into the flame because he knows otherwise the emperor is going to execute him anyway because he just committed treason. And then there's a, what we call in the Hebrew a baskol. A voice comes down from heaven and says that both, of the, both the rabbi and the guard are in the next life receiving their reward. So we learn from this, again, this idea about either passive non-action or here initially removing impediments to dying in a sense. Things that clearly have no purpose in supporting life but are only uh, things that are, are slowing the dying process. So in the next slide, just to summarize, because again, you'll get a whole talk on Gosace and how these things operate. You, you're forbidden to do anything active to hasten dying, is permitted to not subject the ghost haste to interventions that will only serve to impede the dying process, or you can remove those interventions. Touching is permitted to maintain dignity of the body and so forth. So therefore, you can say since anything you do is pa anything you're not doing is passive, you're just not doing something, that Kavod Habrio would appear to operate, dignity would appear to operate here in terms of the ghost haste. Now I want to move from there to non-actively dying terminally ill patients. Judaism defines terminal illness as one year or less, and it's a very complicated definition, which I'm not going to get into. But the point I want to make again is that withholding is permitted, again, because it's passive, when the active intervention will delay the dying process or the terminally ill patients experience pain and suffering that will not be relieved by the intervention. Withdrawing, however, is more difficult. Only if it's an impediment to death and there's no life supportive activity, may one be allowed to withdraw. Anything that is life supporting, one may not withdraw. And I think, again, again I think the things I've already told you really support this. The next slide. So, some of the things that you can withhold under Jewish law would be things like CPR. I, again, and, and again, I will tell you right up front, not every rabbi is going to agree with this. There are many traditional rabbis who say you have to do CPR no matter what. But clearly, even within traditional Judaism, there is a place and a space for which one can make a decision not to do CPR. Uh, you can choose not to put, place a person on a mechanical ventilator. You could, a patient can choose or a person can choose not to give a patient ineffective or experimental anti-cancer therapies. Those things can be either refused or withheld. Withdrawal, as I said, is much more difficult. Now, there's a concept that's coming up more and more now. If you, uh, I, I do some work in Israel, and, and it's really coming up there as well. Uh, this idea of continuous, continuous versus intermittent therapy. So, for instance, take hemodialysis. Somebody's on dialysis, and they've decided they, they're having a lot of other problems, and they don't want to do this anymore. And since hemodialysis is an intermittent treatment, they go two, three times a week, they can simply decide, I'm not going again. Because they have the dialysis, it's ended. The next dialysis is considered a new treatment. 
and they can decide not to go. And that would be passive and that would be something that in, under certain circumstances, they check with their rabbi, their rabbi might allow. A mechanical ventilator is generally forbidden to remove, you know, pulling the plug is generally forbidden since it is considered life supportive in nature. Now what's happening in Israel, uh, about 10 years ago they passed a bill called the Dying Patient Act. It still hasn't been implemented, but they're still working on it on some of the kinks. But one of the areas that they looked at was the problem of people on chronic ventilator therapy who want to have the ventilator removed because the families want to remove because the patients are not, uh, in their minds, leading a, a productive quality of life. And again, there, is, there are Jews in Israel who, who are, very, are very traditional and Jews who are not, and especially among the non, the, 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 the less traditional population, they want to be able to move the ventilator. And it's been illegal in Israel to do that. So what they came up with was the idea of having a ventilator with a, which has time, a timer for how long it will stay on. And for the doctor to prescribe not continuous ventilation, but intermittent ventilation. In other words, patient comes in and I want to ventilate them. And I decide uh, I want to ventilate them for two weeks. I want to put them on a trial ventilation for two weeks. During the two weeks, you'll know whether they're going to recover or not from whatever their problem was, more than likely. And if they, if they do, if you can medically wean them before the two weeks, you go ahead and do that. If you can't, before the uh, two weeks, you talk to the family, you can make a decision about do I want to put the ventilator on after it shuts itself off, or do I not want to put the ventilator on after it shuts itself off? Now, a lot of people think, well, what's the difference? In Judaism, it makes a difference whether you're doing something active or something passive as I've tried to illustrate. That's a big area in, in terms of differentiating in Jewish law, is active versus passive. So here where we don't have those things, clearly you can't remove a, Jew, a Jewish patient who's traditional from ventilator, but as the technology develops, it might come a time where there'll be a, a mechanism with, with which to do that. So to conclude this, to summarize, Withholding is passive and permitted and consistent with dignity under Jewish law. Withdrawing intermittent therapy would be passive and permitted and consistent with, with Kavod Habriot, with, with dignity. Withdrawing continuous, active, continuous life support therapy is active and forbidden as it would violate Jewish laws around preserving and extending life and cannot be suspended for the sake of dignity under Jewish law. So I want to move to the final thing I want to talk about which is food and fluids, which I call the exception to this. And it's really, it is and it's not. Um, food and fluids are considered basic care by most, certainly traditional orthodox rabbis. I know some conservative rabbis. Others, especially when it's a little bit artificially, see it more as a medical intervention, which would put it under the, more the rubric of you could withdraw, withhold it uh, in, under certain circumstances. So, but in a traditional, point of view, from the orthodox viewpoint, even when provided artificially, it's not considered a medical intervention. It's considered meeting the, you know, providing a basic human need to the patient. Now, this especially comes up in neurodegenerative disease patients. And one of the important things, which again, I don't have time to go into in depth, is that primary neurological conditions such as dementia and similar things are not considered terminal under Jewish law. Now, if you look at, for example, here in the United States, at advanced directives, advanced directives talk about terminal condition or an irreversible neurological condition. So, they, so very often under secular law in most states, they equate irreversible neurological conditions, such as advanced dementias and things of that nature, with terminal illness, even though they're not necessarily terminal. And with feeding and good supportive care, you can keep people alive and very, very often in those conditions for years. And from the, therefore, from the rabbinical viewpoint, the choice not to feed such patients may result in their death, and they would see that death as directly due to the lack of food and fluid, as opposed to others, you know, I've heard you might interpret as, well, a patient can be offered a tray, but they're physically unable to eat. And that's why it's okay not to provide it. From a traditional perspective, that doesn't work, because it's really felt to be that even if it's artificial, it's still a basic need and not being provided for uh, a medical intervention. And as I thought about this, I think we'll go to the last slide, I thought about this, I, I came to the conclusion that perhaps really dignity is operating in this situation. Kavod Operat is really operating. Because remember what we're talking about, we're talking about a basic human need is food and fluid. 
And again, this is in a non-terminally ill patient from a Jewish perspective, even though we might not see it quite the same way. And whether this human being, however this human being is functioning, we have to remember they're a human being. And since they're a human being and they're created in the image of God, they're entitled to basic human needs. One of those needs, or two of them, being food and fluid. So in this case, at least from a traditional viewpoint, one might be able to argue that passively not providing fluid and fluid would violate the Jewish concept of dignity because this is a human being, despite their condition, and this is a basic human need to make sure that they're fed and given enough fluid. Now, as I said, not everybody's going to agree with this. This is something, as I was going through the literature, I, I, I came, I came uh, upon me because I really felt that's probably part of why this is, this is the way it is. It's, it's probably the most important barrier to traditional Jews entering hospice, especially with neurodegenerative diseases. They're afraid that they're not going to be given food and fluid, and that they're going to die not of their disease, but die of not being fed and, 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 and hydrated. So, so I, I, that's why I bring it up this way, and I think, again, we frame it in that context of dignity. I think we can see it in a different way that might help make more sense in terms of why we do this. Thank you.